Adults Learning Mathematics is an international research forum, um, which is now entering its 29th year of working with practitioners, researchers, and policymakers, helping people share ideas, those people who are working with adults in a variety of different contexts across a range of countries. And we're very pleased to have you all here today. And it's lovely to see the range of, of people and countries that are, you're representing today. So welcome again. I'm gonna now pass you over to Catherine, who's going to introduce you to the host and will be at your chat master for this event. So thank you all for attending and welcome to the seminar. Hi everybody. Uh, thank you, Beth, for that. Thank you very much for joining everybody. Um, we are very, very privileged to have Linda Al here. Um, I have had some the privilege to meet Linda before at a few conferences and uh, we visited her in uh, Sweden in 2017 on an Erasmus plus work shadowing and it was a great privilege and to, to see the beautiful country and to see your wonderful um, education service to prisons. Uh, Linda is a researcher and a practitioner which is um, very close to ALM's heart because ALM is designed to bring practitioners and researchers together. So it's really good that Linda is, has, has had both roles. And um, we also feel that it's a very, very special event here because there's very little in the field of, of prison education and especially mathematics in prison. Um, I, it's, it's somewhere I am myself, I'm teaching mathematics in prison and I'm doing research. So I'm really excited about this and let's hope that it is the start of more um, sharing and learning from each other. And this might be um, just following what Beth said, the, the conference in Hamburg is, we'll have the theme of numeracy and vulnerable learners. So Linda's topic tonight is quite close to that. So on that, I will pass over to Linda. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> Thank you, everyone who's um, joined us to hear me speak about something that's uh, really close to my heart, and that's uh, individualized mathematics instruction for adults in the prison education context. You see a picture here on uh, the mathematical bridge in Cambridge from the days where we could meet on conferences, and I hope we can do that again soon, but maybe not this year. I don't know. So I'm written a thesis uh, about individualized mathematics instruction in, for adults in the prison education context. And this thesis, uh, it contains of four studies and the four studies has resulted in a model for individualized mathematics instruction for adults. And I call the model MIMIA. This presentation will be quite brief because 20 minutes is not so long, but you can read the thesis if you're more interested or contact me later. But I will present uh, each study for you and then you can choose what you will discuss in the chat rooms later. All the questions in my thesis, they are problem driven. Um, from my experience of teaching, I have learned that we have special challenges when teaching adults. Uh, first, I found that uh, adults' uh, prior knowledge, they have great variation. Unlike when you teach in compulsory school, you know what the students have been doing the year before. But in prison, you can meet young people and old people and people that have quite short schooling and other people that have longer schooling. Some people have forget, for, forgotten almost everything about mathematics and others, they remember quite a lot. But this is very difficult because it can be a mismatch in expectations when you start on a new, new course. In Sweden, we follow syllabuses uh, that are similar to the courses that are given in upper secondary school. So you are expected to have the, the, the correct prior knowledge to, to enroll a course when you are assigned to it. But that is not, often it's not the case. And um, you have to deal with this as a teacher. So 
that was my first um, question. How do you um, gain information about students' prior knowledge without um, tedious testing that will um, maybe break their motivation? That leads me to motivation. Mm, I found that um, others, they have very different motiva motivation to enroll in mathematics education. And this kind of different motivation it, um, is something that I have to address in my teaching because what kind of motivation you have will give you different opportunities to follow the course. And third, I found out that uh, uh, feedback, giving feedback to adults were more difficult than giving feedback to children. I have been teaching children as well, and they are, they are very used to be, um, they, they get feedback every day and they, they just accept it. But when you are an adult, you, you, you might be more proud. You don't want to be bad at something. Uh, you, you want to be good and you want to get praise. But that's not the way to get forward. So that was also a difficult um, issue for me. And my students, we are in prison. So a lot of my students, they are tough guys, you know, they, they don't want to hear that they cannot calculate that the right way. So the three questions was my main concern, but I also have a fourth question in my study, and that's a spin-off from the first study about prior knowledge. Now I will say something about the different studies. So when it comes to prior knowledge, I thought I needed some, some kind of tool to capture the student's prior understanding. Um, but I didn't want to um, have a lot of test because I, I, I would think that the, their motivation would be maybe damaged if they have to do a lot of testing before they start. <clears throat> so I wanted a test that discriminated well among students and provided me as a teacher with an access point for designing individualized instruction. I based my test on proportional reasoning. And um, the reason for that uh, is that, that that is the most pervasive idea in compulsory school in Sweden and in many other countries. It is very, very well researched and I could use what is known from research about the development of proportional reasoning to con construct a test. And one important design choice for the test was to use a multiple choice test where you just mark your answers instead of, instead of giving full solutions. That was because uh, an open response test can be a negative experience for students with low prior knowledge since they may be unable to supply any answers at all. They can just um, fill in something, so they don't need to feel that they haven't answered the questions if they just have to mark the answers. I wanted to avoid a negative experience. And the multiple choice test, uh, it was designed upon what we know about proportional reasoning, so that the wrong answers clearly indicate uh, well-known misconceptions or specific incorrect strategies or solutions that we have seen earlier in research. Here you see an example from the test and this uh, item is from an article by Hilton, Hilton, Dole and Coase. I give you a minute to read it. So your task is to uh, decide if going to the beach is a relatively more particular choice with the year six students than the year five students. You just have to mark true or false when you have decided, and then you will choose one argument, A, B, C, or D, that supports your claim. So in this case, it's um, of course, um, mm, claim D, that is the correct answer. And if you choose one of the others, 
I know from research what kind of misconception that may, may be the background for this. But I also uh, conduct a clinical interview with the students after the test. So they are given opportunities to explain the reasoning. And maybe sometimes they realize that they have marked the wrong answer in the alternative when we, as we speak. <clears throat> uh, it, um, the results show that the test worked in line with the stipulated design goals, namely that during a lim limited time, collect information on different topics and different levels. Uh, and the sh test showed to discriminate well among students. So uh, this information can be used to design individual instruction sequences in the prison education. So you can start where the students are instead of start on page one in the textbook. Let's move on. Rationals for learning. This is about motivation. There is a lot of motivational theories. I sure you all know about that. But I chose a theory from um, um, Stigmel and Olson over the other motivational theories. My rationale for that, it, it is because his view on teaching and learning is that if the students stop learning, it is the educational design that has to change, not the student. He said that uh, to teach someone in the same manner, only more slowly and in smaller groups, it will not help. We cannot expect the students to adapt to ready-made teaching materials. Instead, if the teaching, it's the teaching that need to adapt to the student. And this was very, uh, I like that idea very much because uh, I have the opportunity to do that in the prison education program because I have a lot of time and, and quite few students and all my students, they have quite bad experiences from schooling because if, um, if you have had a good mathematics uh, experience from ordinary school, you don't have to study mathematics in prison. It's for those that don't have um, an upper secondary diploma uh, or maybe in they haven't even um, conducted um, a part, uh, they, they didn't get a passing grade from um, compulsory school. So they remember mathematics with a bit of uh, horror <laughs> many times. They are, they are afraid from mathematics. So I use this uh, rationals for learning from Melin Olson, and he um, talks about the uh, I rational. And that's the instrumental rationale that represents the reproduction of uh, labor. And uh, also that you need mathematics uh, to get on in the schooling system. Mathematics is a gatekeeper for higher education. So many students, they, they are very motivated to get a grade in mathematics. They have a strong eye rationale, but they are not very interested in mathematics as a subject. Um, especially since it didn't went very well the last time they studied. The social uh, rationale, the S rationale, <clears throat> on, on the other hand, it, it's about joy and uh, um, a picture of yourself as someone that likes mathematics and that can cope with mathematics and that has family and friends that thinks mathematics is important. And if you have enjoy mathematics, um, then I have learned that you can, you can give uh, students that like mathematics a uh, lot more challenges because they can, handle, they can handle the challenge. They like to struggle. But students with an I-rational, a strong I-rational and a weak S-rational, and they tend to give up if the challenges get too hard. So that is why it's very important for me to separate between these different rationals. They will both be present in all teaching. But if, if you notice that uh, a student um, stops believe that he can cope with mathematics, 
then, then we say that the irrational breaks down. And if he at the same time has a weak S rational, then it's, uh, he's likely to quit. So Stig Mellon also said that um, uh, uh, if the, the student stops learning because both the I and the S rational has ceased to function, then teaching must uh, build on rebuilding the S rational so we can get the student work again. So when you ask a student if he's motivated for mathematics, uh, <laughs> Two different students can say yes <laughs> with a strong emphasis, but they, can, they may be different kinds of motivation. And for me, it's been really fruitful to separate these uh, kinds of motivations so that I can give students that begins to lose faith, uh, easy tasks and more enjoyable tasks. We tried to categorize a student a case uh, with the I rational and we saw how it changed during the course. And it's quite easy for teachers to use these uh, educational concepts to think about the students. So it's like a thinking tool to check that your students are on the track. Um, you can read about this study in the thesis, of course. Uh, but I will move on. I could talk for hours, I think, but I try to be quick with every study. <clears throat> then we had this feedback. I, I guess the, most of you, you know the feeling when you receive a very critical review right it doesn't feel very good uh, well it is the same for our students <clears throat> uh, i have a case in this case as well uh, and he was um, he had a, a impulse control disorder so he was a bit uh, more explicit than my other students and uh, <clears throat> uh, the work was organized like this, that he was getting assignments and uh, he handed them in his solutions. And I uh, wrote up feedback and then I went to him and said, okay, let's look at your assignment. Here's the written feedback and here's my explanations for your errors. You have to focus a lot on errors, of course, even though you, you say what's good, but of course, we have to improve, but it just didn't work. He immediately went into the effective state, <clears throat> defending himself and arguing for that his answers were in fact the correct ones. And this led to total communication breakdown. I could not reach him. So I was, um, I was ready to give up. I, I said to my colleague, no, I, I can't, I can't teach this person. I, I, failed as a teacher because he, I can't make him listen. Um, but then something happened. He was transferred to another prison and that means that he became a student on distance. So now I sent him the, the written feedback first and then we have a telephone appointment where we discussed his solutions. And suddenly he was like, ah, oh, this was very interesting. I'd be thinking about this and, <laughs> and everything worked like a charm. So we made a retrospective analysis of the events and we found out, um, we found out that um, uh, this mechanism with the delay between the written and the oral feedback, feedback that was the thing that made him um, um, made the feedback work. He had time to reflect on the written response and uh, then he could uh, listen to my oral feedback with interest and, and yeah, because he was, he lighted like a match. And then when he got the time to think that he, yeah, this was good. So our results show, uh, show that the delay between written and oral feedback works as a mechanism that gives the receiver time and space to reflect on the feedback. 
and of course this was a special student but now i use this on every student because even if you don't burst out in anger you may have the feelings inside you know you can't listen to the teacher because you feel <laughs> uneasy so uh, this is something I, I have included in my model i use this as a tool to to get uh, let the students um, think about their written feedback before we discuss it. From the first study with the questions uh, about proportional reasoning, um, one uh, item on the test uh, caused severe trouble for a majority of the students. Uh, almost no one could solve it. So I was very curious, why was this item so difficult? It, it must be something because most of the students, they, they had enough conceptual knowledge to solve the item, I think, I thought. And I know that they did in, in many cases, but something happened. This is the item. It's, um, I have adapted it from um, Morgan Nis and Dr. Jan Quist. Mm. But I put some answering alternatives in, uh, in the test. You can read it and you can uh, consider your own answer. I won't ask you. So I hope you have come to some conclusion now. Well, the, the clay that Richard average speed for the whole walk is four kilometers per hour. It's true. Uh, but most students, they um, say that um, the speed is higher than four kilometers per hour. And um, how is that? We can look at one solution that is very representative for, the, for this error. This is the student Emil. And as you can see, he has just, um, first he had uh, uh, mm -hmm. made a drawing and he, um, he had modeled the heel to be, um, it take, 30 minutes up the hill, uh, 60 minutes, one hour up the hill, and 30 minutes down the hill. So he, he has uh, modeled the hill to be three kilometers. So the, uh, the walk up is three, ki 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 uh, <laughs> three kilometers an hour, takes an hour, of course, and then half an hour down. So now he has everything to, uh, to solve this item, but then he abandons this uh, scheme and he, he goes for the arithmetic average scheme. He just adds three and six and divide it with two and uh, come to the conclusion that the average speed is uh, 4.5 kilometers an hour. And this is uh, typically what like 80% of all the students do. But as you can see, he has, he has all the knowledge he needs to solve the solution. So what is happening here? Hmm. So this common error, uh, our results show that uh, it's not just a misunderstanding of how to calculate average speed. Hmm. It is specifically induced by a linguistic association. Uh, you can, it's the average average, reach as average. It triggers two different solution schemes. First, he has a correct speed sh scheme, and uh, then he abandons it for the arithmetic average uh, scheme. That is not, uh, it's very efficient uh, to calculate an answer, but it's wrong. <clears throat> and why is this important? It's important because it says more about um, how he, he reads the situation and it interprets the situation then about his uh, conceptualization of speed. And when you analyze student solutions to give them feedback and uh, plan for the ne next step in instruction, it is very important, as I see it, to really understand what caused the error because it's not like he has to um, calculate, he, he, he does understand a lot about the speed concept, 
but still there is something that that leads him wrong and uh, is the linguistic uh, term average in this case we have um, the students still have a problem with this one but, but now i can i can see quite uh, quick if it's because of the word average or if it is because they don't know much about speed and I think that there is a lot of situations, especially including rates, uh, where you have to consider if the, it's the wording or if it's the concepts that, that is the problem for the students. So we show how previous theory connecting schemes and representation can be extended to allow alternative explanations for this well-known class of student errors. So together, all these um, studies, um, they um, make up the base for a model that I use in instruction. And that is uh, when the students start at the study entry, they do this test on proportional reasoning. And I follow up with a clinical uh, interview where they can explain their solutions. And after that, I design an individual assignment, um, who, uh, which are on a level that they can cope with, because it's very close to what they could do uh, on the test. Mm -hmm. And in the clinical interview, I also talk about them about their rationale for studying mathematics, so that I have a picture of if they just want to grade or if they like mathematics as a subject. If they don't like mathematics at all, I am very careful not to give them too hard assignments because if they lose faith, it's, they are not hardly to come out on the other end with a passing grade. Uh, the rationale, they, it will change over time, hopefully to the to I, I strive to improve the S rational uh, during the course, so that they can feel the um, joy and the beauty of mathematics. And I um, I follow their how the rationals change during the course. And when I um, give them feedback on the their assignments. I first give them written feedback and I let the, there will be some time before uh, I give them oral feedback. It can be uh, only a few hours for some if they are quite calm and maybe two days for another student. Mm. Uh, and then it just goes on and on and on. Assignments, uh, analysis, feedback, written feedback, oral feedback. Uh, and I keep track on the rationale. And in the end, uh, I, I hope I have given them so good individualized instruction that they finish the course with a, a good grade and with a, a good feeling about mathematics and their capacity to do whatever they want in the future. Because man, many of my students, they feel like, if I can do mathematics, I can do everything because it has been really hard for me. And that's really rewarding for me as a teacher. So that was what I was going to say. And I want to thank you for your attention. But I think that Although my studies has been done in the prison education context, I wonder if uh, you who listens today have the same similar experiences for your uh, teaching adults practice. Because I think that you can use uh, the whole model or uh, parts of the model in, in all kinds of individual, individualized instruction of adults. And I would like to hear you reflect on that. And of course, this was a very brief presentation. And as you can hear, I'm not a native English speaker, but I hope you understood me good. 
<laughs> it's been a while because there are no conferences now. Uh, but uh, yes, I'm really um, interested in, in hearing your uh, um, reflections on this uh, in, in comparison to your own, own teaching practice. Thank you. <laughs>